Well, good morning, church. I trust that you had a a wonderful Christmas, spending time with family and friends, and and most of all, spending time to remember the beauty, the truth, uh, the relevance of Jesus, uh, the greatest gift this world has ever received. I know it was probably a big day for many of you, such a a big day. Some of you have probably just woken up. You may be still in your pajamas, but you're tuning in anyway. But as I was thinking about it, it's been a huge year. It's been a huge year for many of us, and so today we wanted to take an opportunity uh, to pause and catch our breath, to pause and reflect, to reconnect with Jesus so we can reshape our lives around the will and the ways of God as we prepare to move forward into 2022. Because I want to be really honest, if we're really honest with ourselves, whether it's personally or professionally, whether it's socially or even spiritually, 2021 hasn't lived up to any of our expectations. Now, maybe we're a little naive to think that COVID could be done and dusted in one year, but even though the year started well, uh, things quickly went downhill. Their first lockdown happening in the middle of February. Now, I know uh, for all you introverts out there, this was a welcome change of pace. You didn't have to go into the office or see anyone, and every day, Every day was pyjama day. You'd zoom in for meetings, half-dressed, only dressed from the top up. And, and with any night meetings, all you had to do at the end was turn off your computer and in two minutes, you're in bed. It was a fantastic life. And yet for those who are introverts or those who had uh, uh, kids learning at home, it was a very different story. Sure, there was some more beautiful and special family times, but in between there was way too many arguments and, and fights within the family and not enough connection with the outside world to keep us, to keep you sane. Uh, During the first year of lockdown, we we seemed to cope fairly well. Now, I heard about people learning a new hobby or or taking up uh, a new exercise regime, and yet this past year and and these past two lockdowns in particular have seemed to push us to the limits. In in many of us, it has broken our spirits, and, and the enthusiasm that we once had and even the new patterns that we had managed to implement have been lost in the process. Well, the temptation, I think, for many of us is to move on without reflecting, to move forward without learning the lessons for the future. And so before we write off 2021 and put it behind us, I want to invite us to pause this morning and reflect and to hold it before God and wrestle with some of the hurts and the hardships, even the highlights, so we can see more than what's happened to us, so that we can see beyond what is happening around us and start to ask the question of what is God doing? What is God saying to us? What is he wanting to teach us so we can better follow Jesus in the year to come? As we explore and as we reflect this morning, I want to tap into this incredibly human story. The story that follows on from the Christmas narrative. uh, One of the few stories we have from the early life of Jesus. A story that reveals this uh, very human pattern that we can follow in this season, a pattern of remembering, of pressing into the Father. So like him, we can move forward with faith and obedience, shaping our lives around the will and the ways of God. Now to set the scene, Mary and Joseph have managed to survive their very first Christmas. Can you imagine? First, there is the birth of Jesus and, and they even managed to, to uphold the, the intrusion of the shepherds who knows what else was news of his birth spread around the area. And after eight days, eight days, they take him to the temple. They take Jesus to be dedicated as required by the Lord to be circumcised and they remain in Bethlehem until these wise men come to visit. That's when God warns Joseph in a dream about Herod's plan and so they escape. They escape at night. They spend a couple of years as refugees in Egypt before they return home. It's been a couple of years in Egypt. Herod was dead and maybe it was natural causes. Maybe it was knocked off by his son who wanted the throne. We don't really know what's happened in those days. Either way, the imminent threat has gone and God tells Joseph once again in a dream to resettle, to return and resettle as a family in the town of Nazareth. As we pick up the story of Jesus and his family, uh, they spend a couple, of years, a couple of years on from Christmas. Mary and Joseph are living and, and working and raising their family in Nazareth. But everything had changed. You see, as part of the remnant who had been waiting for the Messiah to come, Things had changed. Everything had changed. They knew the Messiah had already arrived and was living in their home. 
And yet as faithful remnant, they continued to follow the Jewish patterns and celebrations. And so every year it tells us they would travel from Nazareth to Jerusalem for the Passover celebrations. More than a day trip, this was a little more of a road trip, about 100 kilometers each way, a a 10-day round trip without air conditioning on the donkey. So they'd pack up the the donkey, they would round up the family and they would join this large portion of their community who were making this annual pilgrimage to the temple in Jerusalem. This was their pattern. This was their tradition. Right up until the time Jesus is 12 years of age, they had made this annual pilgrimage followed by their Jewish customs. And they have done all the right things. And now this year, when Jesus is 12, they're on their way home. They're making their way home completely oblivious that Jesus has been left behind in Jerusalem. That is, until they start searching among the the masses of pilgrims, among their friends and their relatives who are traveling with them and discover no one has seen Jesus since they left Jerusalem. Jesus is missing. In one sense, this makes Mary and Joseph sound like bad parents, doesn't it? I mean, who doesn't check if they have their children when you're leaving for holidays? If you check out your baggage, you you check you've got your kids and they've been to the toilet, then you get ready to hit the road. But remember, this is a, a huge cultural separation between them and us. There was no such thing as a helicopter or a lawnmower or whatever kind of parent we have. Now, they knew it takes a village to raise a child. And so they fully expected that Jesus would be walking along with friends or with family. And so they walked on oblivious for a day, even two, before returning to try and find him. uh, Thinking about this, I still remember when I was about Jesus' age, about 12 or a little younger, and we went to Sovereign Hill with uh, some family friends. Um, And I don't remember. I don't remember exactly what happened. It's uh, amazing how our memories block out those things that we want to forget. I think I was preoccupied with watching one of the reenactments that they do during the day. And all I remember is turning around. Turning around and my parents and my siblings were gone. Nowhere to be seen. And so I did what every kid does in that moment. I burst into tears. I'd lost everyone. I had no idea where they'd gone if they'd left me behind for good. And so I began to cry. Thankfully, there was a guy dressed up in uh, one of the gold rush uniforms who came and and looked after me. He settled me down. He asked me some questions and said he'd help me locate my family. And after a short time, it felt like an eternity, we found them. We found them, they're actually on their way back looking for me, so they didn't leave me for good. And I ran up and I grabbed mum and began to cry again. Uh, As you do, they thanked the policeman profusely. And then we went on our way. And my guess is I didn't let go of my parents' hand for the rest of the day. So usually what happens with children, isn't it? Once lost, twice shy. And yet that's not the picture we're given here with Jesus. With Mary and Joseph, they were beside themselves. They were searching the city high and low for three days, looking for three days to try and find Jesus. And just like any preteen would, Jesus is like, yeah, whatever. See, as much as it takes a village to raise a child, we actually don't know. We don't know in these three days where Jesus has been sleeping, what he's had to eat. And yet after three days of searching, three days of panicking, verse 49, Jesus says to his parents, why were you searching for me? Didn't you know I had to be in my father's house? And then we read these incredible words, but they did not understand. They did not understand what he was saying to them. Can you imagine? Mary and Joseph have been entrusted with the Son of God. They were doing everything they could in their lives to honour God as they raised him. They were travelling year after year to the Passover festival. And while I'm sure Jesus was well behaved all the time, as you'd expect from the Son of God, you can only imagine there were other pressures, there were other challenges that Mary and Joseph faced, that we ourselves, that they could never understand. Even in this moment, Instead of getting out and playing games at the the back of the church, 
He stays in the temple. Jesus stays in the temple, the place where God's presence was manifest, where his people would go to worship. And so rather than follow the traditions of going to the temple and then returning home, Jesus remained there. He chose to remain there and to connect with his heavenly father, to listen and ask questions, to learn about the law and even teaching the teachers of the law a thing or two. There was something different about Jesus. Something different about his, uh, his connection with God. Something different about his wisdom. That even as a preteen, which is pretty amazing in itself, there was something about the words and the ways of Jesus that astonished those around him and caused his parents a great deal of confusion. It wasn't that he was being disobedient. It was that he knew the importance of this moment of his time with the Father, so that as he moved on from this place, he could live in obedience, not only to his parents, but to, to his parents, but to the mission of his Father in heaven. See what happens in verse 51? It says, Then he went down to Nazareth with them, Mary and Joseph, and was obedient to them, his parents. But it says his mother treasured up all these things in her heart. And Jesus grew in wisdom and stature, and in favour with God and men. It's almost like this moment. This moment in the temple is the beginning of a pattern, a pattern of reflection and action that would shape Jesus' life, not only in this moment, but in the year and the years to come. From this time on, he would continually pull aside. He would take time to pause and, and spend time with the Father to learn, uh, to lean into his Father's heart, to, to listen in order to set his direction and ensure that he was moving forward practically and spiritually, not only in obedience with his parents, as it says, but more importantly, in accordance with the will and the ways of God. And that is what caused him to, to grow in stature and wisdom. To receive the, the favour and the respect of both God and those around him. And that's our heart as Christians, isn't it? That's what it means to follow Jesus, that we're learning to put our own wants, our own desires, our own agendas to the side so we can live according to the will and the ways of God. That's what Jesus says to his disciples when he's teaching them. I only do what I see the Father doing. Nothing more and nothing less. Pure and heartfelt obedience. That was Jesus' goal. And, and our passage this morning gives us a pattern that we can follow, a pattern of remembering, of pressing into the Father like Jesus so we can move forward in obedience. We can shape our lives around the will and the ways of our Heavenly Father. Do you see how Mary and Joseph, see how Mary and Joseph and their family and the people of God had these patterns, these patterns of remembering? That's what the Passover and the, the pilgrimage and the celebrations they held were all about. It was all about stopping or stepping back from their current season and situation and remembering what had been. It was about remembering their sin, remembering their disobedience, remembering the hard times they had endured throughout exile and their return to the promised land. But more than just the hard times, it was about remembering God's grace, remembering all these miracles, remembering God's faithfulness to him, to his people, remembering his saving purposes. That's what this annual Passover pilgrimage was about. It's about stopping and reflecting and remembering. And my guess is we could learn a lot from the pattern and the traditions that were given to the people of God. Because far too often, far too often it seems we move on without stopping. We move on without at least slowing down long enough, not only to acknowledge, but to deal with and to learn from our past. And so we end up making the same mistakes again and again. We end up taking everything, taking our sins and our failures and the consequences and the challenges that they bring with us into the next season. And so I want to invite us this morning, I want to invite us to pause, to own our sins, to acknowledge our failures, to, 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 
own up to our shortcomings, to recognise the hurts and the hardships and even the highlights, to recognise the ways God has been working. Let's remember those ways that God has intervened, to remember how we have experienced God's presence and his power with us and for us and through us. We need to stop and we need to remember As we prepare for 2022, we need to acknowledge these things. And most importantly, we need to learn from them. We need to look at what's been. We need to to make time and space to lean into God, to listen to what he's saying, so we can learn from the highlights and lowlights, so we can learn from the, the challenges and the successes, so we can move forward with faith and with hope and with obedience into all God has for us. That's what Jesus does in this moment. Rather than a tradition just coming and then going through the motions, he stops. He remains in the temple. He remains there long enough to connect with his heavenly father, to remember the past, to learn from the law and to listen, to listen to the teachers. Why? So he can prepare himself. So he can ready his heart for a life of obedience. Ultimately, so he could fulfill his mission, the mission of God. On earth. So this morning I want to create a second space, second opportunity to reflect. We're more than just remembering the past. We can start to apply, think about it, what it means to apply these lessons we have learned into the year and the years to come as we follow Jesus. As we do, I want us to ask two questions of ourselves, to ask God what he is saying to us. Through all of the experiences and the the challenges of life, what is God saying to us? As we learn from the past and as we look ahead to the uncertainty, as we explore the possibilities and the opportunities that lay before us, what is God saying to you? And how is he calling you to respond? What does it mean to respond like Jesus? What does it mean to move forward with faith and obedience? What does it mean and what does it look like for us to shape our our lives around the will and the ways of God? Because only when we ask these questions, only when we can step into 2022 with faith and obedience, will we begin to grow in stature, in spiritual maturity, in favour before God and before men. I'm going to pray for us. Then we're going to have a video. A video with some questions to help us remember some of the things that have happened, some of the feelings we've wrestled with in this past year. And I invite us to sit, to sit with the hurts, to process the hardships, to invite the Spirit to teach us, to help us see what we need to leave behind and the lessons we can learn that will help us move forward. And so I want us to take us a moment to reflect on the past. And then we'll stop and we'll worship together. We'll worship God for his faithfulness. And there'll be a second video. A video that invites us to reflect on how God is leading us. About what God is saying to us and and how we need to respond to Jesus as we move into 2022. So I encourage you to take this moment and to invite you to sit and and to reflect and allow God, invite God, His Spirit, to speak to you about the lessons that He has been teaching us, about the lessons He would have us learn, about the things that we need to leave behind and the things that would equip us for the season that is to come in 2022. encourage you to take a moment and to reflect as we play this video.